Okay, those are the Minister of Health's views on how the Patients First Act will transform healthcare in Ontario. Now we've gathered some other players in the system to give us their take. And with that, we welcome former Deputy Minister of Health Michael Dechter, now Chair of the Board of Patients Canada. Stephen Chris, a family doctor and incoming president of the Ontario Medical Association. Gail Donner, Professor Emerita, Faculty of Nursing at the University of Toronto. Dr. Kalvinder Gill, allergist and pediatric specialist and president of a group called Concerned Ontario Doctors. And Lucy Morton, Chair of the Healthcare Divisional Council with OPSU, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union. Good to have everybody around our table today for this follow-up discussion on what the Patients First Act means to all of you. I want to start, Michael Dechter, since your group is called Patients Canada. Actually, before I do that, there's somebody on your board in the interest of full disclosure that we need to say. Yes. Who is that? That is your wife, Francesca Grosso. <laughs> Correct. Okay. So in the interest of full disclosure, yes. we put that out there. Uh, here's what you said before the Legislative Committee at Queen's Park on this bill. Sheldon, if you would. We strongly support a patient's first agenda for health care. It is, in fact, long overdue. However, we are hard-pressed to find patients first within the actual substance of Bill 41, and we are concerned about the bureaucratization of our health care system, where decisions of care will be subject to administrative priorities and not care priorities. All right, let's unpack this a bit, because, of course, the Patients First Act, by its very name, suggests patients are going to be at the center of all future decision-making and will strengthen the patient's voice in the health care system. Why are you suspicious of this claim? Well, I, I think we're more than suspicious. We just don't see where this patient's first uh, is really reflected in the bill. This is a merger of two bureaucratic organizations, uh, both of whom have had bad reviews from the Auditor General. And it is the continuation of a role uh, in direct delivery, which is particularly disturbing to us, because we don't think groups that are set up to be management and administration should be in the direct delivery of care. Imagine if Alin said, we're going to build our own hospital and run it. But that's what the CCACs did with home care. They hired their own nurses. They went into competition with the professionally run, nursing-led, for the most part, home care organizations in Ontario. So we're very concerned that this, rather than being patients first, could be a uh, power struggle between the ex-CCAC people who will vastly outnumber the Lynn people and the Lynn people who have two very separate uh, jobs. So we think this could be patients waiting even longer while this whole thing shakes out. I will get everybody else's take on this as well, but before we do that, th the minister did point out during the course of the interview you, in particular, saying that you kind of sandbagged him and didn't give him a heads up on what your position on this was going to be. I want to give well, you a chance to respond I to wanna, that. I want to be very careful because this is a very busy minister. I've worked for two of them directly and six of his predecessors indirectly. Um, if he did, in fact, consult 6,000 people, I was one of them. Um, we put in a brief uh, la a year ago on the first uh, white paper we raised several concerns, three main ones. I met with him um, for 45 minutes in his office. Before you I reiterated those concerns, yes, last spring. And then when we saw the new version of the bill, which hadn't changed any of the things we were concerned about, I went before the committee and re-raised those points. So, you know, it's as though they didn't read our first brief. As though, and, and the meeting with him was a very constructive meeting. One of our concerns, if I can just go there, is that the care coordination which sits at the CCACs should be pushed down and out to home care organizations, to family health teams, to hospitals, to be closer to patients. And Bill 41, the Patients First Act, doesn't do that. It puts it all, it leaves it all centralized. He and I had that conversation, and I will remind him that when I said that we were, we're in favor of putting care coordination in family health teams. He got a big smile on his face. He said, when I was in a family health team, if we'd had a care coordinator, our lives would have been so much better. And, and this is the major central problem we have, is all of these things are in a bureaucratic administrative structure, not in the patient care system. And, and they need to be in the patient care system. And I was very disappointed. Um, 
that they didn't make that move, and I'm more surprised than he is that uh, they don't. Re he doesn't remember the conversation, and they don't remember our earlier brief, because this is not news. This okay. has been our consistent position. Let's move on. We're going to get some wisdom from the rest of you around the table. Gail Donner, you've looked at this thing. Uh, I a lot have. Of, a lot of the work that went into this bill came uh, from a report that you wrote. Well, no, not quite. Actually, I'm giving you more credit than yeah, you deserve. No, uh, or less. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, actually, the report that I uh, chaired was called "Bringing Care Home." Was a small expert panel. We surveyed a lot of people, did a lot of background work. Our recommendations were solely around delivery. So the kind of thing Michael is talking about, what should happen at the front line, what do families and patients and caregivers really need from home and community care. And our recommendations, in fact, were that fix delivery, really make a patient-centered, and we can get into that later, what a patient-centered system really looks like. Do that first, and then let the form follow the function. Do you believe that the changes that the minister has brought in will put the patient at the center of the health care system? Right now, I think it could enable that. I would agree that the proof will actually be in what happens at the front line. So if, in fact, as he said, um, coordination will move closer to where care is, then there's some hope. If indeed coordination and integration will be aligned and primary care will be aligned, and these are all ifs, then I think we could make some progress. I need to say two other things. Well, one, about my report so that it's clear, but since we're doing full disclosure, mm -hmm. I am doing a very part-time bit of work as an external advisor to the minister, but not on Bill 41, on implementing home and community care uh, initiatives, part of our report, part of his roadmap, okay, et cetera. fair enough. That's good. So I think there's possibility. I don't think uh, legislation is what drives change, unfortunately. I wish sometimes what it drives did. Change? I think what drives change, and I think where we're lucky, is going to be the people in the system. So I think we have some possibilities here. Let me talk to a couple of the people yeah. in the system. You're a family doc, Dr. Chris. I actually what focus now on long-term care, but I spent 25 years providing uh, conception to grave care. So I'm are well you familiar here, with family practice. Are you here to speak as a family doc, or are you here to speak as the incoming president of the Ontario Medical Association representing 39,000 doctors? I'm, I'm here to speak, I think, as well for patients as well, because I think that's, that's who we care for, that's who we're interested in. What do you think of the changes that the minister has put forward in this so-called Patients First Act? Okay, so I could go on for a long time, as you can imagine. I'll perhaps give you two of the reasons, that uh, overarching reasons that we're concerned. First of all, there was no real collaboration with doctors. So there are, as you say, 28,000 working doctors in Ontario. We care for 155,000 patients every day. We understand what's wrong with the healthcare system. No one sought our opinion. There was no active listening to what we have to say. No consideration for what we experience as we care for patients in the development of the Patients First Act. Secondly... You know, first of all, let me just yeah. hold you there. You know the minister... Yes. Um, believes, well, I shouldn't say what he believes, let's put it this way, because there are difficulties right now over negotiations with the OMA and the province of Ontario, yes. that may affect the two of you getting together to discuss other things. Is that possible? You know, we have a history of working constructively with governments over many years in terms of dealing with problems in the healthcare system. I'll give you one example. There was a time when there was a trouble staffing emergency departments, rural emergency departments in the summer. And the government worked with the OMA to solve that. Mm -hmm. So we, are, we have a record of working constructively. But in the last two years, certainly, as the government has acted unilaterally, both in terms of our relationship with us, but in terms of the development of the system itself, mm -hmm. th there has been a separation between us. And that needs to be repaired in okay. order for patients to get the care that they need and want. Second point you wanted to make. The second point, uh, effectiveness. So the LINs were created in legislation about 12 years ago. There was a requirement that there be an assessment of the LINs. If it's been done, it's not been published. There's no evidence that the LINs are capable of carrying out the responsibility that they've been handed. Not only that, the creation of another administrative level, the sub-LIN layer, 
doesn't add one iota to the care of patients. Let me give you a very specific example. Let's say I want to refer somebody to an, an orthopedic surgeon. Will the time to that consultation be any faster because there's another group of bureaucrats somewhere what's, in this? What's the answer to that question? The answer is it will not. It will, it will not, not be. And in fact, if the surgeon and patient decide that a surgical option is what's necessary, will the time to surgery be reduced by the fact there's more bureaucrats uh, in the system? I don't think so. Okay, Dr. Gill, let me get you in at this point. You've had a look at this thing. How does it read to you? I think it's, it's very deceptively titled. I think it should be titled the um, act that puts patients last. Um, there's not a single piece um, of this legislation that actually will do anything to put patients first. Um, what I find is seriously flawed, apart from the aspects of the actual bill, is the process in which um, this bill was actually passed. Um, as you're probably aware, there was very little consultation with, um, with actual stakeholders. Uh, the input that was sought when this bill was actually Bill 210 um, wasn't incorporated uh, into the actual bill. Just there was 30 seconds of background here. Mm -hmm. Bill 210 is what it was called when it was brought in first. Exactly. Then the legislature was, I guess, prorogued. Exactly. That bill died, they brought it back as Bill 41, and that's what we're talking about now. Exactly. And there was no consultations with Ontario's doctors or, or, or Ontario's patients before it was actually brought back as being Bill 41. Um, the democratic process in terms of how this bill came to actually pass is extremely flawed. Um, the, oh, oh, the Liberal Party took it upon themselves to actually shut down debate after the second reading. They then took it upon themselves to cut down the actual hours for the public hearings. They then took it upon themselves to vote down every single amendment that was put forth by both of the opposition parties and there were, there were over a hundred amendments that were put forth and every single one was voted down except for one from the NDPs um, and, and those amendments came directly uh, from the uh, feedback that was provided uh, during those public hearings so we see a very arrogant government uh, that is set on bringing this very uh, flawed piece of legislation forward no matter what. Lucy Morton, your view on it? I have to agree, this to me and, and to OPSU is this was a make work project. That this changes, if anything it's negative, where now there is no accountability, no responsibility to actual patients even though the patients are supposed to be first. Patients um, and, and the public are what pay and support the actual funding for all of this but yet they've been removed from any kind of input or directive now. and. We as taxpayers who support that, we own this. We absolutely own it. But we need to take that stand and we need to stop allowing the directive to just go to the upper echelons, but to actually put patients first at those sublin levels. Because that's the only way we're going to know what those communities and what our rural communities all need. The local health integration networks that have been established, what are there, 14 of them all over the province? Correct. <clears throat> Why do you have a lack of confidence in their ability to manage our resources in this province? Well, I think uh, history speaks for itself. I think that there's been um, the cost has not uh, for privatization, which has been touted to save money, has actually cost more with less service. It affects the members, at the patients. It affects communities. They're not getting what they need. Patients are going in and out of the hospital more frequently. They're returning. I see this every day because what I do is community nursing. And I see the changes are now that the support is to teach family to look after the patients, not for us to help keep the patients at home. Michael Decker, let me follow up with you on something Stephen Chris said a second ago, which is that there was supposed to be a review of how local health integration networks were doing, given that they've been put in more than a decade ago. Yes. I'm guessing if anybody knows whether that review has happened and what says in it, it's you, given how many health ministers you've worked for over the yeah, past 20 I, years. I haven't seen it. It may exist. Um, but um, the Auditor General did do a review which was quite negative. Um, they were given an almost impossible task. Uh, they're lightly staffed. I'm not arguing they should have more staff, but the idea that you're going to have a board and you're going to have 30 or 40 staff and they're going to coordinate you know, something the size of a small province in terms of uh, health activities, and then you've left out big pieces. So the price report said put the doctors in. Mm -hmm. The bill doesn't put the doctors in. The first draft of the bill put the hospitals in. The second hospitals version of the bill out. took yeah. them back out. So it's a very confusing, it's really, 
it, it seems on one level more like what they've done is they've merged, or they're going to merge the LINs and the CCACs, but it's really a CCAC model that emerges because they're going to manage the community sector um, in a very hands-on way. And evidence of how bad this can get was in the London Free Press the other day, a leaked memo saying um, we're going we're to cut hours for home care mm -hmm. to balance the budget. So essentially, we're going to ration care, not based on patient need, but based on a budget number. And, and to me, you know, we, if we're going to say people need X amount of home care, but we can only afford to pay for 80% of it, we should at least say to them, look to some other pocket for the other 20%. But we're not doing that. We're, we've got this pretense that, you know, the, the budget number is the right number. And there are lots of people out there who, they're physicians and their, their nurses know that they're not getting enough care, mm -hmm. and yet they're told, um, you know, well, this is the care that, that we're going to pay for, and the implication is that's the care you need which turns this thing into exactly the opposite of what it should be. It should be trying to pull care together around a patient. But when you really look at it, what, what it's doing is putting all sorts of arbitrary rules in that are administratively driven. They're budget driven. And, now, and I think it's very difficult for a lot of providers to work in that environment. Gail Donner, let me ask you about the local health integration networks. You're the one person among our group here today who sounded somewhat optimistic that this could work. Why do you not share the suspicion about so, the lens that the others around the table do? Yeah, I wouldn't go so far I don't share some of the uh, suspicions. I guess I'm a, somewhat of a pragmatist. Um, I worked hard to provide the minister with a series of recommendations about what needs to happen to really put patients and families first. Did he take those recommendations? And he publicly stated that he would accept all those recommendations, developed a road map on home and community care with 10 action points that in, in fact reflect some of what we uh, recommended. The implementation of those is moving very slowly. I've been around a long time. I'm increasingly impatient as I get older, so, but it is moving slowly. My concern is that we are using a lot of oxygen in the system, debating legislation that now exists. Um, our recommendation was don't change form until you get the function right. Mm -hmm. Form has now been changed, I think, as people, obviously, all who are very concerned that it is what fam we need, a client family-centered system. That means, and what that looks like, is that instead of saying, here I am and here's what I've got for you, what you say is, here I am, what do you need and how can I help you get it? Not that the state will provide everything, everybody knows that, and clients and families know that, they're not expecting Every, everything to pro be provided. But what we need is that kind of conversation at the front, front lines where instead of providers saying, here's the list of 10 things I'm going to do for you today, the providers say, I'm going to sit with you, we're going to co-design your plan, and I'm going to help you get what you need, even if the state can't provide it all. I think we could do that. There's going to need to be a lot of pushing by all the kinds of people we are around the table. But the pragmatist says to me, could we please get on with making the changes we all know we need to make? And those are changes, frankly, that are we need coalitions of providers and we need families and their caregivers Caregivers are incredibly stressed. 70% of home care is provided by caregivers, family, friends, neighbors, whoever they are. So my focus, quite frankly, and uh, that's why I was very careful to say my expert advice is on the delivery of home and community care, not on legislation. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a legislator, but I really believe that it's here. Is it perfect? Far from. Does it have all the limitations my colleagues are saying, yeah. I don't know how many but of you saw this. Move. Let's move. That, that sounds like the transit plan. We're, we're talking <laughs> healthcare today. Oh, you know how that's going. <laughs> that's going very well. Can I show right. this here? Some of you may have seen these ads uh, that were in um, 
daily newspapers not too yeah. long ago. Uh, these were, uh, this was taken out by a group of, uh, like yes. a subgroup of the OMA, right? A section right? of general and family practice. A section of that and put that in with the help of the Ontario Medical Association. Okay, there they are. Now, that, that's, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, it costs quite a pretty penny to put a full page ad in one daily newspaper, let alone many of them, which mm -hmm. you did. Uh, can you really not find anything about this patient's first act to support? You know, it, it, there's probably something in there, but for the most part, what, what you're hearing is that the bureaucratization of care and not the focus on care is a problem. And, and you know, after uh, several years now of a poor relations between physicians and the province, we are trying to get our voices heard by the public because we think we are speaking to the issues that you're hearing around this table. Except that the public... Look, this is my impression. I could be totally wrong. I don't know that the public has a clue what LINs are, even though yes. we've done many programs on it yes. here and we've tried to explain yes. how care is sort of, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? How it's ration, not ration. Uh, ration is a good ration. word. Well, <laughs> ration is good. Very good. How word. the decisions are made on, on who gets what and how resources allocated. are allocated. That's the word I'm looking for, allocated. So, you know, I use the metaphor off the top, you pick up the hood of the car, you know, they don't know how the engine works, they right. just know that when they want to drive the car that it exactly. works. Exactly. So is, if, if after the patient's first act comes in and really takes flight, are you saying the healthcare system is going to work worse? It's hard to predict what will happen, but it certainly isn't going to work any better. In fact, it's, it, it, it's probably true to say that if you take resources and put it into bureaucracy, there's going to be less resources for patient care. So I, I would feel it's going to be worse. But the minister says he's going to find 5 to 8% savings by yes. amalgamating yes. these yes. two bureaucracies. Yes. yes, so I have a rather large grain of salt that I carry around when I, for when I listen to the minister. You know, I, I think that you know, when governments promise efficiencies and savings money on day one, you know that uh, by the end of the year they'll be, they'll, they'll be calling for more money and it, will be, it won't be working. Dr. Gill, let me tackle a different angle on this, which is there are lots of provisions in this new Patients First Act that affect doctors straight on. They tell you that they want to be notified when you open a practice, they want to be notified when you close a practice, they want to be notified if you're going on an extended leave of your practice, all of that kind of thing because obviously it will affect your patients. Mm -hmm. Any objections to any of those requirements? I think there's ob objections from Ontario's physicians to every aspect of this bill. Um, as I've said before, there's not a single part of this bill that Ontario's doctors, that Ontario's patients that I've spoken to, that, oh, that either of the opposition parties have been able to come forward and say that they support this aspect of this bill. I will go a step further and say that I, um, I believe, and, and, and there are many physicians in this province oh, that believe that, that this bill will actually harm our patients. How would it harm patients? Um, I think some of the comments that were previously made by oh, by Minister Hoskins were actually oh, very misleading. Um, like he, what? He made it seem as though um, there's no new resource allocation that's going to be required and somehow these two flawed organizations were being amalgamated and, and were somehow going to magically solve all of our health care woes. I don't think he put it that way. I think he um, just said if you get rid of a layer of bureaucracy, by putting those responsibilities but under the... He's creating but, but, just but, creating. but he's creating... Yeah. He's, yeah. He's, so, so each of these sub is actually going to have their own supervisory board. And the CEOs uh, from the CCACs actually become the VPs of the of the LINs for the community care. So you don't see a layer of bureaucracy disappearing at no, all? No, there's right? actually more being created. And um, currently, it... Um, Oh, the LINs are costing taxpayers about $90 million a year. And the Auditor General's reports, two of them, in fact, have said that the LINs have never met their mandate and have not been able to deliver patient care at the time that it's needed and in the place that it's needed throughout the entire system. Okay, here's what I need to understand then. Michael, to you first on this. If, if the evidence you are all advancing today so clearly suggests that this Patients First Act is a wrong step in the wrong direction, and most governments I know don't want to take wrong steps in wrong directions. They want to do stuff that actually makes things better and makes them more popular at the same time. Why are they doing it? That's a very difficult question to answer. They had some very good reports done, which the minister referred to, Price Baker, uh, Gale's report. They, they did a lot of work, but when it came to putting together the implementation plan, although there was a big consultation, I believe this plan was written a long time ago within the ministry and they pretty much stuck with it and it was a bureaucratic response 
to re-centralize power in the ministry. And so it's a, it's a power grab for the ministry? Yeah, it is. I mean, the community boards are, are largely gone. The appointment of the CEOs is, is by the minister. The, these are more like regional offices of the ministry. And that's been tried twice that I can remember, and it's failed utterly both times. It works in community services because you've got weak stakeholders. It doesn't work in health because you've got strong stakeholders, and you can't push them around, if I can say that. But, but here's, the, here's the central problem of it. It, it is a top-down solution Absolutely. to a bottom-up problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is, at the point of care, there aren't enough resources. They're badly organized. We have physicians working very, very hard without the supports around them. I mean, I think the minister was speaking from his heart when he said, when I was practicing as a physician, if I'd had access to a care coordinator, I could have said, here, take Mrs. Jones and figure out how to get her into the rehab center or into home care. It would have allowed Eric Cosmos as a physician to look after more patients, to have more leverage. And, and instead of that kind of approach, what we've done is come top down with layers of bureaucracy. And I think it might work, like I'm an optimist, <laughs> but you know, some areas of the province will make it work because they're good at working together. The northern mm -hmm. areas, the rural areas, just because there isn't much there and they tend to get in a room and whatever has been done centrally, that somehow they make it work. But in Toronto and in the larger centers, this is going to be chaotic and it's not going to help those very stressed family caregivers. One of our board members, Andrew Ignatieff, has been a family caregiver for 30 years. This is the former Liberal leader's brother. Yes, and Andrew came with me to the consultation meeting and he listened for about an hour and then he put up his hand and he said, I don't know what a Lynn is. I've been a family caregiver in downtown Toronto for 30 years. I've worked for community organizations in health. I don't know where the Lynn is. I don't know what it is. I wouldn't know how to find it. Hmm. And, you know, that's the problem, is, is that this all looks great on a flow chart, mm -hmm. but on the ground, what you've got are people practicing medicine, people delivering home care, and it needs to come together. And maybe there's a way this gets, it comes together, but it's not really clear in the act. And I agree with Gail, we'd have been better to figure out how to make it work and then written it up later. Lucy Morton, let me put this to you because I, I, I can appreciate that the Ministry of Health may want to accrue more power unto itself because after all, he or she who pays the piper calls the tune. And even beyond that, when people have problems with the healthcare system, they don't go to the Lynn, they go to the Minister of Health or they go to their local MPP and say, help. If they're going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, held accountable for all of the decisions that are being made, and if they're in fact paying the shot anyway, if they're in charge of the purse strings, why shouldn't they have all the power? Well, I think what happens is it's impossible to deal with every single issue that that's going to occur. And there, there's thousands of them every day throughout the province. And the thoughts of them being able to respond to each individual person, I think, is a fallacy. I think it would be great if it could happen, but it's not reality. It just isn't. And I believe that what's going, what's happening with this piece is that as much as, as some of the argument about bringing the LINs and the, the um, CCACs together is a duplication of services and the cost that, that, that they're incurring, they're seeing a 6 to 8% reduction. In fact, that's what's happening with all the providers. Every providing agency that they have is paying for their bureaucracy and their um, administrative fees. So that's costing huge. That in itself, by stopping the competitive bidding process, could in fact at, by his words, at 3 to 5% with only the CCC, could save millions of dollars to put back into a, a broken system. But I don't think it's possible, getting back to that question, it, it's absolutely impossible to have one person or a group of people, or they're going to be bringing in another whole floor, if you will, to take these phone calls. And then, depending on what happens, depending on who the um, provider is, depending on who in fact is going to be the coordinator, there'll be a whole trail of trying to find out who those people are in order to try and implement a change. Mm -hmm. So I think it'll delay the process tremendously and cost Can a I lot more money. Please. As well? mm -hmm. So, you know, we've learned something in the development of team-based care for patients with chronic complex diseases, which is if you put the patient in the center and everybody works around them cooperatively, you get better outcomes. So you can have all the power you want in the center, 
but has nothing to do with health care. Yeah. Health care is about people working together. And until this government gives up the conceit that somehow power in their hands at Queen's Park produces a better system, that's the wrong approach. They need to rethink it from the beginning. They have to cooperate with physicians and the other stakeholders who are day-to-day -day involved in care of patients. That's the only way to go forward. It's a fundamental change that needs to happen here in Ontario. I, I hear you, but Dr. Gill, their view is if we're going to catch hell every time something goes wrong, and they do, uh, and, and if we're responsible for uh, making sure that this $50 billion budget doesn't turn into a $100 billion budget and suck up the entire budget of Ontario entirely, well, then you got to give us some power to, to sort of craft a health care system the way we see fit. What's wrong with that logic? I think the Auditor General actually said it the best. She said that the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Health have actually never held the LINs accountable. And, and if they've never held the LINs accountable, how are they now going to hold the LINs accountable when they have even more power? What does that mean anyway, holding the LINs accountable? What would that require? Um, I think... Um, I think what is happening here is that um, with this bill, there's a complete command and control. Um, oh, the Minister of Health is taking control of every aspect of health care to the point that even provincial medical standards will now be determined by the Minister of Health as opposed to by medical experts. That is extremely concerning. Um, and, and that can open open the floodgates in terms of patient care further being rationed based upon provincial budgetary um, um, sort of goals or provincial priorities you know we're going to either or we're going to prefer hips and knees and uh over other things you but know? then it goes against the scientific evidence it goes against the, having clinical decisions being evidence-based mm -hmm. go ahead Gail uh, i just was going to make a comment i, mm -hmm. I wound accountability mm -hmm. I, I think that there are probably three kinds of things we need to see happen one is transparency and i think People are talking about that around the table. And I think there are levels of transparency. One is transparency around where is the accountability uh, mm -hmm. and uh, system transparency. And the other is transparency for families and clients. So it's, do I know what I'm entitled to? Do I know under what circumstances? Do I know who's coming to see me? Do I know who to call? Do I know if the same person's coming tomorrow? That there's an openness around that. We don't have that right now, and we need to find a way to build that in. The other piece is the accountability, and it's also at the LIN level, the accountability would be related to the transparency. What are the outcomes we are going to expect, and what are the outcomes we are going to hold ourselves accountable for. We haven't seen any of that. I think that's critical, and I think that kind of accountability. And the last is equity. We haven't talked anything about equity. Mm -hmm. There are incredible variations at the system level in different mm -hmm. lens, at the individual level, client to client, family to family. If we could push these three principles, among millions of others that I'm sure people around the table could identify, but at least these three. Okay, he's giving me the, the, the high sign. So we I, got 30 seconds left. You wanted to make a point. I just wanted to touch upon the accountability aspect. In terms of one thing that we haven't ta actually talked about, which is extremely concerning with this bill, is the patient-doctor confidentiality and the fact that patients' rights are being breached. So patients no longer have the right to their privacy. So the ministry... says that's absolutely false. Well, the, um, th well, the province's privacy commissioner absolutely disagrees with him. And, and the minister says this notion of, of somehow him or other people in his ministry rustling through your files to look at your so patient's you information through, is not true. So um, if you read through the bill, it does indicate that ministry-appointed bureaucrats can go into medical clinics and medical facilities and go through any and all documents, including private patient medical records. We need to get all of you back to continue this discussion because i got a feeling even though we just did 40 minutes on it, we've barely scratched the surface. Mm, yes, Anyways, I want to thank you all for coming in tonight and helping thank us you. out. Thank you so much. Hopefully yes. better understanding the patient's first act. Thank you. Thanks thank so much. You. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.